I was just uh, praying and during worship and just I feel like the Lord said recognize the way that Jesus reveals himself because yes there's times he reveals himself as joy but there's other times he comes as the prince of peace other times he reveals himself as the miracle worker and so if I only want one way that God's going to show up I'm going to miss him in all the different ways and I love when God shows up as joy but I love him when he shows up as peace or as the teacher, or the deliverer. And so I'm just excited because I don't want just a certain way that God has to show up every time. It's great when laughter happens and people are happy, but it's great also when peace comes or when the deliverer comes. So realizing it's like, God, any way that you want to reveal yourself, I just want to be aware of that. And so is that good news at all? Or Okay. Um, I'm going to have Tekoa. She had a dream the other night just to share. I think it's going to encourage in what the Lord's doing. Let's give it for Tekoa. Um, so I had a dream two nights ago, and I woke up, and I was so excited because the dream was fun. But um, pretty much it was all these young people, and we were all on the beach. And I remember it was like in a cove, and the stairs we were running down were like, made from like the side of a hill or something and there was a ton of people in the water and we were all drunk in the Holy Spirit. There was a big group of us that were drunk in the Holy Spirit just like in the water dancing and singing and then in the ocean there were like all these washers and then there were people just like lined up behind the washers just waiting to put their stuff in. And so I woke up but I just remember it was me, Addie, and Daniel, and we were having like so much fun, like jumping in the water. And then I kind of started praying about it, and I was like, "Why were there washers? And like, why were people waiting there?" And I kind of felt like the Lord was saying, um, especially for young people, like they think the only way to become clean is to put everything in the washer. Like that's all their mind is set on is I have to put everything in the washer. Like that's the only way. And then there's a group of us that weren't waiting in line for the washers. We were just rejoicing in the Lord, baptizing people in water, having fun in the Holy Spirit. And so I just thought it was encouraging, like, um, especially for like people our age, like just to be telling others that like putting your stuff in the washer isn't the only way. Like there's another way and that's Jesus. Cool. Hold on. So just, uh, how about just pray for baptisms and people that need to get baptized. Just release that. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So, Father, we just um, we just welcome your presence right now, God, and we just ask that if there's anyone here who um, has never been baptized or been dunked under the water and come up a new creation, Lord, we just ask that you would put it on their hearts right now, Lord, to just um, make that step forward into your kingdom, God, into getting to know you better and. Um, 
becoming friends with just the Holy Spirit, Lord. So we just ask that right now. We just um, declare that over this body. In the name of Jesus. And if anyone wants to get baptized in water, let us know too after. So see one of the leaders. You're good. Um, I've been doing taxes recently, and that's not the most fun thing in the world. But, you know, when they asked Jesus if he paid taxes, he goes, go to the nearest lake and go fishing. And the first fish that you catch, there's going to be a coin in it, and that's going to be my taxes that I owe. And I was thinking, that would be nice to have that today, the taxes we owe. What if the IRS is knocking on your door and you say, sorry, I don't have it, but go fishing, go to Pismo. They're probably thinking you're crazy, but that was Jesus. He did things that were really outside the box. He did a lot of things that are like, whoa, you're kind of, are you of this world? And he wasn't, you know, he was in a different world. But, um, you know, we, yeah, the ministry at Pismo has been fun. Um, we had an interesting thing that happened. We were walking and I saw this older man, or actually he's pretty young, he's only like 55 or so with his wife. And um, he had a Cal Poly, he had a Cal Poly jacket on. And I was like, okay, I've seen you before. And sometimes when you want to, you know, evangelize, you don't go straight to the punch. So I said, hey, Cal Poly, my dad went there and also my brother went there and did you go there, asked him, and I really didn't care if he went there or not, but I just want to have normal conversation, and he goes, yeah, and so anyways, I said, hey, right when I walked by, I felt like the Holy Spirit says that you have pain on your right shoulder that goes down here, and, I, and he goes, yeah, I actually have it so bad I can't sleep at night, and I said, I didn't guess that, that wasn't something that I randomly just thought of, that was Jesus telling me, so he, because he wants to heal you. And so I, I asked him, hey, can I pray for healing? I don't have to touch you. I can be, you know, five, six feet away or whatever. And he goes, no, I, I couldn't do that because you don't know what religion I'm in. And so he had to run away because he didn't want to receive the healing presence of Jesus, even when it was a spot on word. And, you know, even if he was a Satan worshiper, God was pursuing him. Jesus was saying, I want to bring healing to you. But when we receive healing, it also demands a response to let go of the other idols we're worshiping and follow Jesus. So that's why he said no, is because he couldn't lay down his God to really serve Jesus. So a lot of times Jesus asks, do you want to be healed? And they say no, because it demands a responsibility with the healing. And so that was in interesting to see that. But uh, Alan's son, Elijah, it's been amazing. I prayed for him a month ago for just impartation, for healing. He got the gift of healing a month ago. The Holy Spirit's been showing him exact places where people have pain. It's been crazy. It's been fun. And so I've just been, he's going to, you know, your son's going to share next time or whatever. But I'm just really encouraged. He's only like 16 years old, 17. And I'm like, man, do it again, Lord, you know. And so anyways, I want to preach tonight on entering our promised land. And I think a lot of us, you know, we can ask, hey, how's your year been? How's your last 10? And so I'm still in the wilderness season. And I think there comes to a point where we finally can live in our promised land. It's not God's will that we're in the wilderness season our whole life. He wants us to be in the will, in, not in the wilderness, sorry, in the promised land. You know, and so that's not just a certain location. That's a place where our soul's at rest. You know, so that's really, I'll take God, God's rest over money and riches, you know. And so, you know, the first words that God spoke to mankind, I want to read it. It's in Genesis 1, it says, God bless them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So the first time that God speaks to man, in the original translation, he actually bowed down. He, put, he went on a knee and blessed man. And, you know, it's kind of hard to see God as really boring or maybe religious when the first command was be fruitful and multiply. And I'll, we're not going to go down that route. But, I mean, God, that was the first thing he told man to do, okay? And to fill the earth and to have dominion over the earth. 
And so what the enemy would want to do is do the opposite. So he wants to kill, still, and destroy. Don't multiply. And the opposite of having dominion or dominating is being a victim. And so God called us to be more than overcomers and to, to dominate in life. We could actually dominate as believers and not always being in a victim mentality. You know, Jesus overcame. And so if I only see Jesus as a suffering servant on the cross, that's going to be my identity. But he's no longer on the cross anymore. He's the risen king above every name and principality and demon. And so realize that we're seated in him above every name. And so we can actually, actually overcome in this world. You know, I don't have to be struggling my whole life. I can be living in victory and dominate. We can dominate. And not using it in a way to like dominate people, obviously, but dominate over the enemy. And so that is the victory that God wants us to walk in. And so I'm just like stoked. I mean, I've been listening just to some good, just faith building preaching that it's like, yeah, I'm just not as, we're not sinners anymore. We're saved by grace, but now we're sons and daughters and we can have victory on this side of the world right now. We don't have to crawl our way into heaven. We can be overcomers now, you know? And so anyways, so the first thing that, so when the Lord speaks to Moses, this is Numbers 13, 1. He said, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. And so the Lord so tells Moses to do that. And Moses selects 12 leaders to go into the land, the promised land, to spy it out and to check out, you know, who's living there, what kind of land it is. So for 40 days, they're spying out the land. And this is the report back. It says, this is Numbers 13, verse 27. Just bear with me, it gets good. It says, when we went to the land where you sent us, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. The fruit was actually so big, it was a cluster of grapes that was so big, it took two men to actually carry one cluster of grapes on a pole. Okay, this isn't small fruit. This is huge fruit. But it says, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. So they're just overwhelmed right there by all the different enemies. I mean, you can make like a rap song out of all the ites and Amorites and... I feel like I'm rhyming. But Caleb, he had a different spirit about him, and he quieted the people before Moses and says, let us go up at once and take possession of the promised land, for we're able to overcome it. He had a different spirit. He wasn't a victim. He was an overcomer. In verse 31, it says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we. They gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out, saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the Nephilim there. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. So they're actually just reporting what they saw with their eyes, they're not really making stuff up. They're, there's actually giants in the land, but they're only saying from natural perspective. They're not moving in, the, in faith. And so God actually got really upset with just reporting what they saw in the natural realm. That's the same as like just saying the facts of what's happening today. It's not enough just to quote all the deaths of COVID and all the giants of today. We got to be moving in the opposite spirit. And what is the Lord saying? I don't want us to repeat information because they're, they simply repeated information and the Lord was not happy. He said it was a bad report. Anyone can just quote the numbers of, yeah, these are the deaths and all the problems that the enemy's doing. And they knew the enemy. They knew all the different types of enemies. They said there's a principality here, there's a principality there. They knew all the different types. But their focus was on the enemy, and they don't even mention God in this. 
They said, this is the enemy, but where is God mentioned in this report? That's why it was a bad report. And so what, is, what happens when we only report what the enemy's doing? This is what happens. This is in Numbers 14, verse 1. It says, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried out, and the people wept that night. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children should become victims. Would it be better for us not to return to Egypt? Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. So when they're just quoting what the enemy's doing, the God, all of God's people are living in despair, there's fear, and they want to go back home. They want to go back to Egypt. And so realizing when we just quote what the enemy's doing, that this is what happens. They didn't say to some people were in despair. All of the congregation wanted to leave. <clears throat> okay, it gets a little bit better. But here, <laughs> but here is Caleb's, Joshua and Caleb, they were the same people they were, in the, the, they were spying the land for the same amount of time, but they had a different report. And so this is the good report. This is in Numbers 14, verse 7. It says, They spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So you would think they're looking at a different location. They saw the exact same thing, but completely two different reports. So the first report is, yeah, the giants are big. We can't overcome. We're, we're victims to them. The, this report which is an overcoming report, a report of victory, says actually, he didn't even name them as giants, he says there are bread to eat for breakfast. So that's a different perspective. We're not the prey to the enemy, the enemy's our prey. That's what it says right there, and bread tastes pretty good, so he's saying there are bread. Then he says their, their protection's been eliminated from them, so they have no protection. There are bread, and then the Lord goes with us. And so he, Joshua and Caleb, they're not fixated on all the different types of the enemy. They don't even label all the different enemies. So he doesn't focus on the giants and how big they are. He says, no, don't fear them. Don't focus on them. Because when you focus on the enemy, you end up living in fear, despair. If you focus on your giants, you're going to keep looking at them and then be intimidated. Don't even give them the time of day. And so don't keep looking at the, the giant of fear. Don't keep looking at the giant of whatever it is. You gotta, who are you magnifying? You're going to magnify God or the giants? So the first report, they're magnifying the greatness of the enemy. The second report, they're magnifying God and how good the land is. He doesn't even say it's a good land. He says an exceedingly good land okay, that flows of milk and honey. Milk and honey is not a necessity. That's actually a luxury. That's something that you don't need, like, oh, I need honey today, okay? Maybe your spouse says that to the other spouse, I need my honey. But that is not a necessity. Like, so when we go to the promised land, it's not just getting our necessities met, it's actually getting our desires met. And it's a land flowing with it, which is abundance. It doesn't run out. And so realizing, you know, it says in Joshua 1.13, it says, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. So when we're in his promised land, we have rest from oppression. We have rest from anxiety. We have rest from any of the stuff that's attacking our peace. And so that is what Jesus, yes, we're going to go to heaven one day, but I want to live in a reality of heaven now, bringing that to earth. I don't want to just suffer and crawl my whole way. I want to live in victory now and live in freedom now. Yes, when we die, we're going to be in freedom. I want to have freedom this very moment. And it's a land flowing with it. It's not just barely enough to get by. It's an abundance. And so the bad report 
you're thinking, okay, what happened to them? I mean, the Lord wanted to wipe out all of God's people and restart. So I think he took a little seriously. Obviously, we're under the new covenant. So if you make a bad report of what's happening now, he's not going to wipe you out. But for every day that they were in the promised land spying it out was an extra year in the wilderness. So they had 40 more years in the wilderness because they simply had a bad report with their mouth. And so it's actually very important what we say with our mouth. We could see something, but what are we declaring with our mouth? Are we declaring defeat or what the enemy's doing? Or are we declaring what Jesus is doing, his victory? Power in life is in the tongue. And so it actually matters what we keep on saying. If I keep saying, oh, I'm just, yeah, I just struggle, struggle, struggle. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And so even if I feel, let's say I feel fearful, I need to move in the opposite spirit and say, no, I'm peaceful. You know, if I feel depressed, that might be something I'm feeling, but I need to declare the word of God. No, I have joy. Let the bound say I'm free. Let the depressed say I'm joyful. Let the anxious say I'm peaceful. And so let the weak say I'm strong. So whatever you're feeling, that's not the truth. You go and say, what does God say? What does the word of God say? And so people, well, you don't know how long my condition is. You don't know how powerful the word of God is, though. If you had a con condition for 40 years, God's been around a little bit longer than for 40 years. And so realizing that, I'm not saying that to bring any condemnation, but to bring victory to anything we're dealing with, that the word of God actually does win. It's still relevant for today. And, and it does work. And... You know, how did God start the whole world? He spoke it into existence. And so he could have done it any other way. So there's power of life and death in the tongue. And so when you start feeling a certain way and you start just keep repeating how you're feeling, that's re reinforcing the lies of the enemy. So start speaking the truth of God's word despite how you feel. You know, when they were in the storm with Jesus and the disciples, and Jesus was sleeping, the disciples, like, I don't think Jesus was very proud of them just complaining and just, yeah, well, we're just very transparent about the storm. No, like, there's times to be, <laughs> there's times, and there's times we got to be real, but there's a point where we can't have our emotions above the word of God. And yes, we might be feeling like this in the storm, but I'm going to speak to the storm and not just about it forever. That's how we stay in the wilderness. We keep talking about the enemy and the storms of life and the mountains, and we're still in the same place. So let's go in the opposite spirit and declare the word of God. You know, when Jesus, he had the gnarliest, you know, encounter with the enemy in the wilderness, and Jesus didn't rely on his encounter he had with the Father. He didn't even rely just on prophetic words. He relied on the word of God, but he spoke it out. He spoke it out, okay? So I'm just fired up. <laughs> and so what are the keys to living with like a victorious mindset like Joshua and Caleb? Because they were the only ones allowed into the promised land. It was them and then the next generation. Everyone else missed it. I don't want to miss I don't want to live in the wilderness my whole life. I want to start speaking the truth and live in my promised land now. It's for, and it says it's for today. The promised land's for today. It says that in Hebrews 4. And so what are the keys to Caleb and Joshua? And I just have a couple numbers. And it's the first thing is he has quick obedience let us go up at once and take possession of the land. Let's not delay. Let's just not wait for another confirmation. We see the land. Let's take hold of it. So quick obedience. Okay. Another key, he focused on the goodness of the land and not on the giants. He says the land is amazing. It's a land flowing milk and honey. He's not focusing all the different types of the enemies. He's focused on the goodness of the land, on the Lord. Okay, and he focused on God being the solution. He said the Lord will bring us into the land. He's not saying we're going to do this. He wasn't self-reliant. He was God-dependent. Because the first report, we can't do this, we can't overcome. But the, the, the good report is God's going to bring us into the land. And one of the big keys, too, 
is it was a small enemy and big God. We have it sometimes reversed. It's a, we think it's a big enemy and little God or not even mentioned. But it's a big God and actually enemies little and defeated. I mean, he said that the giants of the land were his, their bread. Okay, that's a pretty small giant. Is it turning to bread? Okay. <laughs> okay, you guys doing okay? Um, so just Proverbs 18.20. It says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So we, we have a choice daily to be under the waterfall of death or waterfall of life. But it's with our words. And so I know you guys know this before, but being intentional that I'm going to choose to be under the waterfall of life today. Even if all hell's breaking loose and all these things are happening, I'm going to be intentional about speaking truth and life and victory. <clears throat> you know, Mary, so when she was pregnant with Jesus, I don't worship her, but I want, I want to honor her. She's an amazing woman of God. And when she was pregnant with Jesus, she could have been like, yeah, the enemy's going to want, and could have, could have focused her gaze on the enemy and how they, it's going to attack her. But she made it very clear. This is Luke 146. My soul magnifies the Lord. That was the key. I'm going to choose to magnify the Lord. I might be in a tough situation. I might be in a place I don't have a home. But I'm going to magnify the greatness of God. And that brings peace, life, joy. Psalm 34, 3, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And so it's a choice daily that we can make. And that decision will actually be a doorway into the, in the promised land. It's actually going to be, we actually have responsibility. You know, they couldn't just rely on the sovereignty of God to get them in. They actually had a choice to get into the promised land with their mouth. <clears throat> Okay, so this, just a couple more things. Um, when, G, when God says in Romans 8, 37, he doesn't say that we're just conquerors. He says we're more than conquerors. So whatever giant that's coming in our way to, to get in the way of the promised land, we have to have a victorious mindset. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm way above this. And so if it's a giant of fear, if it's a giant of the government, if it's a giant of a virus... Are we going to keep magnifying how big they are and even quote all the numbers? Or are we going to magnify the solution in the word of God and Jesus? And so it's being intentional. I don't want to know all the numbers of all the deaths. I was like, what is Jesus doing though? What are, what are the lives that are getting saved during this time? Not all the people that are getting sick and dying. That's a reality. We don't, we don't ignore it. But I'm going to choose to magnify the king. And not the giants anymore. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Well, uh, let's invite the worship team up. Um, thank you, Jesus. I think I had one more thing. Hmm. I just want to just read a couple more quick verses, and then we're. I just want to pray for people after. <clears throat> Actually, I just, I, I need to do a testimony and then we're going to, sorry, just wait about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe four minutes. Okay. So there was a time where I was going through a, a lot of just warfare, a lot of just heavy stuff coming against me. And, you know, there was the enemy and, you, you know, you get in that place where you feel like you're in a pit and you keep regurgitating what's happening. So you keep reinforcing it. So then it keeps getting stronger because the reality of it gets stronger and stronger. And then people say, how are you doing? And then you say, well, this, this, and this. And then you talk to someone else and you say the same thing and you keep quoting. You keep quoting exactly what's happening. And so it's, the, the fortress gets stronger and stronger. And the giants get bigger and bigger. And don't get me wrong, it's a time, there's times to be transparent, but there's a time to zip your lips and speak life. Okay, so there I went through a process for about three years of just under, you know, torment of fear 
And I literally, I'm just going to share this, for two months, I had like a, there was witchcraft coming against me. There was a witch at night coming and cursing me. And I kept saying, well, this is happening. I kept reinforcing it. So I was getting stronger. And there came to a point where I just said, I'm going to stop talking what the enemy's doing. I'm going to zip my lips and I'm going to speak life. And it, that's, it actually started bringing transformation and the giants started getting littler and littler and literal, and then they're gone. Amen. And so when you're going through a hard time, transparency, sometimes we elevate above the word of God. We got to eventually, you could say, okay, people know what we're going through. All right. We understand and it's, it's tough, but let's zip her. They had to be silent when they walked around Jericho and then they declare the word of God. So maybe you need a season of stop talking death. Even if it's gnarly, even if it's crazy stuff, and start declaring the word of God in life and the victory. And so that's what I want to close tonight. And we can go in the song. Uh, but Jesus, I just thank you that you've already given us authority in our tongue. And there's power of life and death in our tongue. We don't always need another person to pray for us. We can actually declare with the word of God life and victory. And so, Lord, I thank you that you've given all of us authority to declare and to even move in the opposite spirit and say, let the weak say I'm strong. Let the depressed say I'm joyful. Let the bound say I'm free. Let those who feel like they can't hear God say, I can hear God. Those who keep saying, I don't get dreams at night say, I get dreams at night. Those who feel like, well, I don't feel forgiven. No, I am forgiven. So, God, we don't elevate our emotions or experiences above what you say in your word. And so, God, we just thank you for victory. And, God, we just thank you that you've made us overcomers. We're no longer victims. But we're overcomers. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, God, we just thank you for tonight. And we just take you out your word, Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. And so, God, no, no matter what storm we're in, no matter what's going on, we choose to speak life. We choose to magnify Jesus. God, we just thank you for power of life and death that's in the tongue. We thank you that we have authority over these giants to speak to it. He says, speak to the mountain, it'll be thrown in the sea. So whatever mountain's in our way, we're not going to keep speaking about it. We're going to speak to it to be thrown in the sea. So Lord, I thank you that you've given everyone authority to speak the truth, regardless of feelings, emotions. Lord, we love the emotions, but we take the word of God above how we're feeling. And so Lord, we bless everyone here. We thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen.